He proclaimed good news to step forward. He bound up the broken heart. He proclaimed freedom for the captive. He released prisoners from darkness. His life led to his death on the cross. It is finished, he proclaimed upon his death. His mission was accomplished. He was the sacrifice for all humankind. And he is alive today. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, so before we get started uh, into uh, announcements and then get moving into the service, I just want to take just a second and I want to, uh, to kind of prep you. I, and, and a couple of things that I've been meaning to tell you uh, and that I should remind all of us from time to time. First of all is uh, this is not a silent service. Uh, we don't uh, expect you guys to be quiet during church. And what that means is when you hear something that you agree with, let us know. Amen. We're happy to hear that. Let's, let's practice. Everybody say amen. amen. There you go. And I know you can even do it better than that. One more time. Amen. There it is. Good. See, it's that easy. It's that easy. So that, that being said, this morning, and many of you may already know this and have experienced this, but this is Easter, and so we are celebrating a resurrection, and the term he is risen is a real common term during this particular celebration. And he is risen. Amen. You would think, why is it he was risen? Well, it's he is risen because Jesus is still alive. And so the reason that we talk about that when we say he is risen, if you hear me say that in the sermon, I would encourage you to respond, he is risen indeed. Okay? It's, it's basically... A resurrection, amen. Okay? Amen. And so we're just going to kind of go with that. I'll prompt you when we get to that point. Anyway, I'm Brian. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am the pastor here at Christ Church Pueblo West, and this is, without a doubt, the best Sunday of the year. Amen. And we come together amen. to celebrate. So uh, let's uh, let's take care of some business, and then we'll get, uh, get into what everybody came for this morning. First of all, I want to encourage you that if you are brand new to us and would like to uh, get connected with what's going on at Christ Church Pueblo West, here's how you do it. Uh, that phone number, 719-735-8848, is the number that you would send a text to from your smartphone. And if you are brand new and, put, and text the word connect, you will get a response back that will ask you to send in your first and last name, and an email address. And if you do that, it puts you on our texting list. And so when things come up uh, and you will uh, be alerted, you will get a text message as to uh, service time changes, events, things that are going on at Christ Church Public West, ways in which you can plug in and serve in the community, all these sorts of things. And then, of course, prayer requests for the body. And so we are very excited about that opportunity. If you are already... Oh, one got a little ahead of me. If you are already a part of the church body and have not yet signed in, then you can go to uh, the same phone number and text the, wel the word welcome. Uh, I'm sorry, we got those backwards. Yeah. Welcome is for new folks, connect is for existing church family. Okay, let's move on now. Uh, Bible study, adult Bible study happens around here on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, uh, right here in this room. Uh, right now we are in the book of James. It's a terrific study. Uh, we have one more week of not holding it. I'm, uh, the reason why I'm giving you the announcement this week is not to invite you, but to invite you a week from this Wednesday, which will be the 27th, when we will resume uh, the Bible study, which has taken a break as our teacher uh, is out of town right now. So we will be coming back to that on the 27th. Everybody is, is welcome, and child care is provided should you uh, need it. All right, moving on. Uh, impact is our youth youth group, our youth ministry, and it's fantastic. And if you are even considering uh, having your kids get involved, and of course I didn't turn off the notifications on my phone, uh, then what I would say 
is this. We meet from 5.30 to 7 o'clock on Thursdays from 4th graders to 12th graders, and we have the opportunity to eat, fellowship, to learn, and to be active outdoors and do all sorts of great things. But beyond all of that, our youth group is designed to have an impact in Pueblo West. And so right now, uh, we are in the process, once we get past Easter, of putting together uh, some spring activities and ideas, and we're really always looking forward to having more young people join us, and always, always welcome. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, we have a uh, cornhole tournament coming up on April the 23rd from 1 o'clock until we're done. Now, what it's actually going to look like is kind of fluid right now. We're not exactly sure how many folks are going to come or how it's all going to work out. It may end up where we just get a few families show up and have some fun, which is fine. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, we are uh, looking for both volunteers and participants, and you can do both. Uh, so if you would like to be a part of that, that's fantastic. Uh, next week, we have some great, uh, exciting news coming, uh, and we're also going to talk more about what Gear Up is and how that's going to plug into uh, Christ Church of Pueblo West. Okay, so then next we have, coming up in June, uh, we will be joining the Caring Pregnancy Center in their Walk for Life. Uh, we once again will, and I uh, pun intended, we will be resurrecting Team Jesus, uh, and we will be walking as a group uh, at uh, Mineral Palace Park last year. Uh, our efforts um, raised more than $2,000 for Caring Pregnancy Center, and it's a terrific thing. Uh, yeah, they you guys, so hey, yeah, fantastic there. So uh, we're looking forward to that. It's coming up June the 4th, and we'll, uh, if you're interested, we'll have some sign-ups, and if you've got any questions, uh, please feel free to ask me or Joe, uh, and we will uh, be able to help you out with that. Then finally, yes, for Friday, that cross, had a wheel attached to it, and it came from Pueblo West Walmart all along McCulloch to the building. And when we did this for the very first time last year, it was just Joetta and I. And this year, we nearly, well, we more than doubled the number. Uh, there were five of us. Uh, and uh, next year, we're planning on doubling the number again. Uh, and uh, But I wanted to show you this picture because this is Judy Young. She's not here this morning. The reason she's not here this morning is because her grandchildren are in the worship team at Fellowship of the Rockies. So she goes and, and shares with them on Easter. But uh, I know she'll be back uh, the following Sunday. But Judy is um, retired. She is so active. And she said last year she saw that this happened and knew she wanted to do it this year. Wasn't sure if she was going to be able to. I can tell you she did with no problem whatsoever. She had a great time. She made it the whole time. So right now, you got no excuse for not signing up for next year. All right? So we're going to look forward to that. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's everybody stand and let's start worshiping and having an amazing Sunday. Resurrection
You can be seated for a second. I'm not known for praying short. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> All right. Welcome, welcome. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. All right. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, I want to welcome you all. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. And I'm here to, to pray, and we're just here to welcome the Holy Spirit in. And, um, you know, when I when I get ready to pray, pray and when I think ahead of time, I always like to give examples. And this week, I'm like, all right, it's Easter, Lord. What do I pray about? <laughs> and the response was, duh. <laughs> Literally. I, that's what God told him. He's like, duh. He's like, it's Easter. It's Easter. I have nothing else to pray for because uh, Jesus did it for us. That's right. He's our example. He is our example. And um, I do have to give a little shout out because my example is my dad, and he's here with us this morning. And, uh, you know, there's something to be said for living in a house where um, your parents believe in God. Yes. Um, I am here today because of that man and my, my mom. And um, he, he built a cross, too. My dad made that cross. And so... Um, so that's what I'm trying to do with my kids. And I encourage you to do it even if you're not biological. And like, like Brian says, invite your neighbor's kid. Invite your neighbor's neighbor's kid. Just don't be weird about it. And so <laughs> that being said, even without the example of parents, which I was so blessed to have, the Bible is your example. And it says it right here, whether it's on your phone or in a book. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verse, uh, verse 15, I'm sorry, 15, verse 3 through 8. For what I have received, I have passed on to you as first importance, or you at the first, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures, and that he appeared. I know I'm going to say it wrong. Cephas? I don't know. Cephas. That is Peter, and then, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500. That's what I wanted to focus on. When people question what happened, the Bible is a history book. The Bible is a, is a love note. And we look to history for everything. It says right here, Jesus appeared to 500. That's what we're here to share today, folks. We live today because what Jesus did for us. So pray with me. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, we want you here each and every day. Today we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And we're so, so, so very blessed that we have the opportunity to celebrate in freedoms. Father God, help us to be an example of your love for each and every one that we encounter. Whether it's friend or foe, we are called to be your example. Holy Spirit, fill our hearts. Be with Brian as he shares your word today. And be with Zach and Haley and Christy as we worship your holy name. And thank you so much for all that you do for your mercies, glory, and goodness each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.
there are those two words that when they pop up on the screen, he won't. He won't fail you. The presence of God is here this morning and it will not fail you. You open your heart and you invite him in. And when you do that, absolutely everything changes. Absolutely everything. Take one moment right where you are and join me and let's have one more bit of prayer. Lord, we are present here this morning and we know you are as well. You are our strength, you are our power, you are our presence. And we pray that you move in and through our hearts and our lives in such a way that when people see what's going on in our lives, they see you. Holy Spirit, please show us what it is you want us to gain from this morning's message, from the music, from the prayer. Put it upon our hearts and make it evident to us exactly what it is you're saying that you would have us to grab a hold of and take home and share with others. Because, Lord, we need you. We need you in every corner of our lives. In Jesus' most holy, precious, and power-filled name, God's people all said, Amen. You may be seated. I was feeling better because last week I missed missed you guys. Last week I was watching from home because I got to tell you I was not doing so hot, and I certainly did not want to share that with you. That I'm going to tell you we were talking about the uh, 180 degree opposite of what the Holy Spirit is, and so this morning as we come together, let us remember what God has done for us the healings, the the blessings, the opportunities, the resources that he has poured into our lives. You know, on a regular basis, we can look around and see what God has done for us in so many ways. And, you know, quite often we take him for granted. There are sometimes we even think it's us who did. But it isn't the case. God is active. God is at work. And he's doing it through you today. So as we come to our offering time, uh, I would ask our ushers to uh, to step out with uh, with the buckets, and and I and I would tell you this: when God places upon your heart how it is you would be able to join in sharing your resources with the the things that He's doing, then that is how you give. Let's pray, Lord. We are so grateful for the opportunity to be a part of Your plan and Your will and Your way. You have given us so much, and we are grateful for the blessings that we receive by joining you in the work that you do in and through this church body. Thank you, Father, for blessing us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be a part of your team. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. service that people least like to see to the part of the service that they most like to see. And if you are a fifth grade or younger and would like to come and hang out with me this morning, 
uh, you are welcome to do that. And I, I got to tell you, the kids that spring out of their seats and, and run up here like that uh, completely make it worth getting out of bed in the morning on a Sunday morning and coming and doing this. This is awesome. All right. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Whoa, you guys are looking good today. This is awesome. Oh, that's great. Make an entrance. I gotta like that. Wow. We may have to have. Oh, and speaking of which, uh, in looking at how awesomely dressed these uh, young people are, um, you're going over to change and you go over there. Okay. Uh, we will, I, if you would like to hang out for a little bit after the service, um, I have a little bit of experience taking a picture or two of my history, and so I'm happy to do a family photo uh, or even just a picture of your kids if you would like. Uh, that uh, I'll then shoot you an email and you can do whatever you want with. But you um, can't waste this. Uh, okay, so I think that's a little loud. Tell me this Has anybody ever done something really cool for you? No. No! Okay. Um, somebody needs to work on that. Has anybody ever done anything really cool for you? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what it was? Not really. Not really. I knew it was cool, but, but it didn't sink in quite that much. All right. Well, then we're going over here. So, I love... Hold up, hold up your ring. Show, show them your ring. There you go. Her, her ring matches her dress. That is a really cool ring. Where did you get that? Uh, it's a Yanni Pop. That's Daddy. from Eden. And so, is that a really cool thing somebody did for you? Uh, yes, but it's from Easter. Okay. It's for Easter. And, and I know that, but so when we, uh, when we think about cool things, have you ever done anything really cool for somebody else? Yes. Oh, there we go. <coughs> what? Um, helping my brother, Michael. Okay, well that's pretty good. I mean, there were there were, we've had a Sunday morning up here where she wanted to throw things at her brother, Michael. So that's this is a really nice change. Uh, and so when when you think about somebody doing something really cool for you, what pops in your head? What really cool? Really cool thing has happened for you. Mm. You don't know? That's not coming to mind right now, is it? When I ask you a question, your mind goes blank, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I get that. Same thing happens to me when I come up and, and preach. It's like, it's gone. That's when we start praying, okay? okay. So, all, all, all the reason I'm asking you about this something really cool that somebody has done for you or that you've done for somebody else is because I want to tell you the story. I want to tell you a story about God, and God decided he wanted to do something for you. God decided he wanted to do something so cool for you that it would change your life forever. And what he did was, from up in heaven, he sent his son. He said, son, you need to, you're going to have to go down. And, and Jesus is his son, and Jesus says, yes, I know. I knew I was going to have to do this. And Jesus came and he was born of a baby. Remember the, at Christmas we were talking about the baby Jesus? He had the manger and everything. Yeah, she remembers. And so Jesus came and he lived a life of about 30 years, maybe a little bit more. And he taught people about what it was like to be close to God. And that's great. And he, and he healed some people. He made them better when they were sick. He even... He even brought a couple of different folks back from the dead after they had died. But the coolest thing that Jesus ever did for each and every one of you guys, and this is going to sound so weird, he died. Jesus died. And he did it for each and every one of you. He did it for each and every one of them. And he even did it, believe it or not, for me. Because we needed him. And the reason for that is because you know when you guys do something that gets you into trouble? You know how that works, right? Yeah. You get into trouble, and then you get punished. Not if you get punished when you get into trouble. Nod your heads. There we go. Yes, I knew that. 
And so when we think about it, we get punished because we do things wrong. And then we end up having to pay the price. There's a consequence. Well, what, when we do things that are wrong in God's eyes, it's called sin, and somebody has to pay for it. Well, Jesus came so that we wouldn't have to pay for it. So Jesus died. They put him on a cross, much bigger than that one, but you get the idea. And they left him there to die, and he did. And they took him down and they put him in, it's called a tomb, it looked more like a cave. They put a big rock in front of the door, so he couldn't get out, just in case he wanted to, but they knew he was dead. But they put him in there and they sealed it up. And that was on Friday. So he stayed in there all Friday, he stayed in there all Saturday. Sunday morning, an angel showed up. Yes. Is he alive? Oh! Right. Spoiler alert when the girl gets it. Yes, he did. He did. And what's really, really cool, what's really, really cool, is that you'll see pictures all the time of the tomb being empty and the stone having moved away. But what's even cooler is this. Jesus did not have to have the stone moved away to get out of the tomb. The angel came down and moved the stone so that you and I so that we could look in and see that he wasn't there anymore. Jesus was already gone. He didn't need to come through the doorway. And do you know why that is? He rose into heaven. Well, not quite yet he didn't, but he eventually. You're right. But who who is Jesus? He, he is... God's son. God's son. Very good. Jesus is God's son, which makes him actually also... God. God. All oh, these kids get it. I love it. And so when we look at Jesus and we see that Jesus is God, then we understand that God was willing to come and do something very painful, very difficult for each and every one of us. And did you know, Jesus doesn't look at a crowd like this and say, I love these people. He doesn't do that. Jesus looks at a crowd like this and sees each and every face, and he loves each and every individual. Every single one of you, Jesus is thinking of individually, not this room full of people. He's looking at your heart. And so when Jesus did what he did, he was thinking of you. He was thinking of you, 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 and you, and every one of us. And he knew your name. And so when he rose, he showed that death can be defeated. We don't have to be scared of death because Jesus already beat it. He loves you that much. And he says, you know what? I want you to hang out with me. Be my buddy. Get to know me. And on top of everything, he offers us a forever life. It's called eternal life. So, all I want you to remember is this. Jesus came, he died for you, they buried him. On the third day, he came and rose from the dead. And he came out of the tomb on his own. Nobody had to let him out. Yes, look at this. That's what I'm talking about. I'm sure that's not what she's excited about, but I'm going with it. That's how we should all feel. Just like that. Because of what Jesus did for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for these amazing young people. I ask that you bless them this morning in amazing, amazing, unimaginable ways. May today be a day when they have an aha moment, when they get it. Lord, may they see you at work in and through the people around them. May your Holy Spirit be tangible. May hearts and lives be changed. Please bless and protect these youngsters and help them to be the light in the lives of others. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, here's the bucket. There you go. Grab something on your way out. There you go. Big thing. Grab the big thing. Mm -hmm. Let me shiver, shiver you up so you stay awake the rest of the sermon. There you go. Oh, you swap it? Oh, you're welcome. That's awesome. Okay. We can all go home now. So, a couple of years 
after the 2015 Super Bowl victory, the Denver Broncos started off their season pretty good. They had a pretty good season going. Bronco team chaplain Reza's the day recently shared what that season was like, at least at the beginning. The Broncos had won all four of their preseason games, not that that makes a whole lot of difference. And then they won three of their first four regular season games, and they had just come off of a 16 to 10 victory over the Raiders, which as Bronco fans know, is certainly a reason for celebration. The following week, the New York Giants were in Denver to play the Broncos. And as the teams took to the field at the beginning of the game, the place was going crazy. It was absolutely nuts. How many of you have ever been to Mile High Stadium for a Bronco game? Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. It's crazy loud. Everyone's on their feet. The stadium was rocking. And their roar of a cheer was just deafening. Then, after kickoff, something happened. It went south. The Broncos fell apart. The Giants, the Giants, absolutely awful one in five Giants were taking it to the Broncos. And by halftime, the score was 17 to 3. But it felt more like 50 to nothing because it was the Giants. Guys, middle school teams were beating the Giants. <laughs> and so when time ran out in the first half and the teams were leaving the field, heading into their locker rooms, the mood had changed. Of the 76,000 fans in Mile High that day, what must have been 75,500 were, well, let's say they weren't cheering. They weren't trying to encourage their team to perform better. They weren't even quiet and stunned. They were loudly booing the Broncos. In a space of 90 minutes, everything, absolutely everything had changed because the team had not performed the way that the crowd had expected them to. The fans in the seats, they turned on their team. And Jesus knows exactly what that feels like. After riding into Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna, the crowds welcoming him. And they welcomed him to what they perceived to be a victory. And in less than a week, many of those same people were shouting, crucify him. The Gospel of Mark paints the picture. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 7. One of the prisoners at the time was Barabbas. <coughs> Excuse me. A revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate. And they asked him to release one prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews, Pilate asked? For he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priests stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call king of the Jews? They shouted back. Crucify him. Why? Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder. Crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip and turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. You see, Jesus had not been what they had hoped he would be. He hadn't come to defeat the Romans and to install a new government. He had come instead to defeat death and to offer a rescue from sin, to open the door to eternal life for all, all who would repent and follow him. But that wasn't what they had been cheering for just a few days before. Even so, when Jesus well, he didn't stomp off the playing field. He didn't take his ball and go home. He leaned in, and he did what needed to be done until it was finished. And aren't we glad he did? You see, Easter is a celebration. It's a celebration, believe it or not, of our freedom. You could even say that it's our Independence Day. 
where we as followers of Jesus have been given independence from the constraints of sin, a freedom that is directly connected to Jesus' freedom, from what appeared to be the constraints of death and a tomb. Now, if you remember, over the past three weeks, we've been kind of looking at the three different times that Jesus had told the disciples, explained to the disciples what was going to happen. Or more to the point, Jesus said it what must happen. They heard him. They heard him say that he must die. And they heard the words when Jesus had explained that he would be resurrected as well. But that part, that part just didn't, for some reason, that part just didn't register. It didn't register with them. It was beyond their understanding. It was beyond their ability to comprehend. So not long after their arrival in Jerusalem, the disciples, they had a meal with Jesus in the upper room. A meal where Jesus had told them that one of them would betray him. By the way, I want to ask you, and I, and I am asking for a response, who is it that can betray you? Who can betray you? Those that love us. Those that love you. Those that you're closest to. Your friends. An enemy can't betray you. You expect nothing from them. You don't trust them. So there's no betrayal. It's almost expected. But if somebody who is close to you that you love, when they go against you, that's a betrayal. What Jesus had said would happen, well, it happened. Matthew chapter 26, verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Jesus had been arrested. He'd been taken before the, high, before the high priest and then in front of Pilate. The accusations flew, the beatings and humiliation commenced, and I can only imagine that at this point the disciples' heads must have been spinning. They must have been asking themselves, what had just happened? Didn't we receive a hero's welcome just a few days ago? Indeed they had. But as things were set in motion by their arrival, things were playing out exactly as Jesus had described they would. But certainly, not as the disciples had hoped they would. Then what I would surely imagine the disciples believed to be the absolutely worst thing that could happen, it did happen. Jesus was crucified. All of their hopes, all of their dreams were right there hanging on a cross, dead. And to top it all off, what Jesus had said, John chapter 19. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. See, the word Jesus had used was to tell us that. And that statement to all who heard him would have been their sign that Jesus was done. It was game over. And one definition that I came across for to tell us die said that the, in the New Testament times, when an employee had completed a day's work or finished a project, he would tell his boss to tell us die. This was to signal that whatever it was that he was assigned to do was now completed. But there's more to it than that. And we now can look back with the benefit of history and see more clearly. The word to telestai is also, believe it or not, used in business. It was written on business documents or receipts in these New Testament times. And it indicated that a bill had been paid in full. The Greek, the, the Greek English lexicon by Moulton and Milligan says this. Of the time, receipts are often introduced by the phrase to telestai, usually written in an abbreviated manner. And the connection between receipts and what 
Christ accomplished would have been quite clear to John's Greek-speaking readership. It would be unmistakable that Christ had died to pay a bill, to pay their sins. And while the disciples had seen and heard Jesus forgive the sins of people several times over in their time together, they really had no grasp of the overall picture. It was just a small portion of what God's grace was actually doing. It was just a little glimpse. It was so small in comparison to what was coming or how Jesus' death and coming resurrection would play into this. But that was about to change. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Now, we had seen in Scripture prior to this where the Marys had been making preparation for anointing Jesus' body. Since they didn't have a chance on Friday because everything had happened so quickly and wouldn't have been allowed to do so on the Sabbath, early Sunday morning would have been their only or first opportunity to do so. So they showed up and things began to happen. Verse 2, suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And the guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. And honestly, i got to tell you, this is my favorite scene in all of Scripture where Jesus is not present. Maybe you can toss in that bit about the talking donkey in the Old Testament. I kind of like that one, too. But this is mind-blowing. This is amazing. I would have given anything to be there and see this happen. This is so cool. Young people, have you ever been in an earthquake? Have you ever experienced an earthquake? No? I mean, other than your, your brother or sister jumping on the bed while you were on it, you know? That might be as close as we get. But an earthquake, what happens in an earthquake? Anybody? Tell me what happens in an earthquake. Moves. The earth moves. Nice. It does. Ground shakes. Stuff falls. The ground can even open up. It's a real attention gap. When God wants us to pay attention, he does big things. He does cool stuff. And that's what was happening here. And I want you to pay attention to what's going on. First, there was an earthquake. Then an angel came down from above, and I can tell you, in Scripture, angels are not little chubby dudes in diapers with bow and arrow. <laughs> scripture often refers to angels as being part of an angel army. So these guys are tough, supernatural beings. The only two we actually get names of, you may already know this, are Michael and Gabriel. They are warriors. And so I would say it's probably safe to say this guy had that kind of a persona. So he rolls the stone aside by himself. And it probably took two or three people to put it in place in the first place. And then he plops down on top of it, and then he does something that I think is really cool. He just decides to show up God's glory. To say that this angel was glowing would be a huge understatement. I mean, his face was like what? Lightning. 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 When lightning happens, it's amazing. Photos of lightning. What does it do? It lights up the whole area. These lightning strikes lit up miles. That's miles and miles of clouds that are lit up by those lightning strikes. And it's just for like a ten thousandth of a second when that happens. It's very fast. And this angel was lighting up the whole neighborhood. People were pulling their shades down left and right because it was so bright because this guy showed up. It's so amazing. And why is that? It's because God is amazing. God is over the top amazing. And you're about to see more evidence of just that. Verse 5, Then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid. And he said, I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come 
see where his body was lying. So in scripture, when an angel shows up to give good news, he frequently would show up and tell whoever he was talking to, first of all, to not be afraid, because they have such a presence. So at this point, we can be pretty sure that after he tells them that, that some good news is coming. He explains that he knows why the women were at the tomb. He knows who they're looking for. They're looking for Jesus. And he shows us that he knew of the crucifixion. Apparently, the news of the death of Jesus had reached heaven. That's certainly interesting to me, because as far as I know, there are no documented cases of anybody ever surviving the crucifixion. It just isn't something you come back from. So the body of Christ was, in fact, dead. Jesus had been killed. But then, then we get it. We get the news we have all been waiting for. The news you came here this morning to hear. It's in verse 6. And the angel says, he isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. Kids in Sunday school say some of the coolest things. Mackenzie wasn't trying to start a theological debate. She just wanted to make a point about Jesus' resurrection. Her Sunday school teacher had tried to encourage her class with the assurance that Jesus is or was absolutely everywhere. But for Mackenzie, that didn't just sound like it made a whole lot of sense. It just wasn't right. So she said, she, she raised her hand and she said, I know one place where Jesus isn't. The teacher curiously replied, oh really? And where is that? The bright little girl stood up and she said, he's not in the grave. What a great reminder. Our omnipresent God has chosen to keep his presence from the grave. For just as the angel had said, he isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where the body was lying. Now stop. Stop right here. Listen to those words. And think about what had happened. He isn't here. Three words that change everything. A tomb could not hold Jesus, then the words that are about to be the foundation of our faith are spoken. Young people, this is what I would like you to focus on. This is the part I want you to remember right here. The words, he is risen from the dead. You see, death was not the end for Jesus. He was just getting started. And keep something in mind. As we've been talking over the last few weeks, Jesus had been telling the disciples, he'd been sharing that this was going to happen, and of course it did. Somewhere down the road, these guys would have had what I would consider an aha moment. Maybe you're having one right now. You see, the angel showed up and he opened the tomb, but when he did that, did Jesus come strutting out? No. He was already gone. The angel moved the stone for the Marys, for the disciples, and for you and I to peek into the tomb and see where the body was. Now the angel refers to the body because Jesus had been dead when he was in the tomb. And the body is gone. Why is the body gone? Because he is risen. He is risen. Amen. Amen. And he is risen indeed. Let's try that. He is risen. Perfect. The angel has one more thing to say. He's got some instructions, some things that he wants to share with the Marys. And so he says in verse 7, And now go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. And remember what I have told you. He told them not to be afraid. He told them Jesus wasn't there and that they needed to go. And they needed to go and tell the disciples. 
they needed to spread the news. The culture that would tell you on any day of any given week that women were not worthy to even testify in a court of law, the culture that was now being given a what for, this culture was just getting an in-your-face, in-your-face kind of redo of what it meant to be a woman by Jesus. Jesus was showing that no matter what your culture says, each and every one of us has value to him. Verse 8, the women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. They rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. Yes. Frightened and filled with great joy. That's kind of cool. It's kind of like when you get married, huh? <laughs> and as they went, Jesus met them and he greeted them and, he, and they ran to him and they grasped his feet and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. And they did, just as they were commanded. They ran quickly. And who did they come across? They came across Jesus. Not only were they told by an angel that Jesus had risen, but they had seen it for themselves. They were the first. These women, not the disciples, not the Pharisees or the guards, but the women who had come to the tomb to anoint the body. Boy, think about this. That would certainly be a really cool story to tell your grandkids. I mean, can you imagine hearing your grandma say, oh yeah, I remember that one time when we spoke to the risen Christ outside of the tomb? Oh, come on, grandma, we heard that one a thousand times. That would be the best testimony ever. But you know what? It's one that you and I get to share, too. Do you know what it means when a baseball player calls his shot? When he comes up to the plate bat in hand. He steps up to the plate and he looks the pitcher in the eye. He moves to where he's going to stand in the box. And he, I wish Andrew was here, I'd have him do it. And he takes the bat and he puts it on his shoulder and quite often, as Babe Ruth did, he did it with his hand. He pointed to where he was going to hit the ball. He pointed to the, the fence he was going to hit it over. Often we see in the movies where the, the player comes up to the, to the plate, steps in, looks at the pitcher, and then points with the bat as to where he's going to hit the ball. It's called calling your shot. And when a player actually makes it happen, well, this was Jesus calling his shot. He had been pointing to the fence the whole time. But few were listening, and even those who had tried to listen weren't really sure what they were hearing. They weren't sure he could pull it off. It was all unclear. It wasn't something anybody even ever said they were going to do before, but he did it. When a ball player calls a shot and he hits the ball out of the park, he gains new respect for his abilities. Other players want to know how he got to that point, how he made that happen. They want to know what it was he did to get to that place. When Jesus called his shot and then pulled it off, that made believers out of many. And it caused many of his followers, both then and now, to go back to the things that Jesus had said prior, prior to doing what he did and to discover that what Jesus had said before must have must have been right. It must have been true. Because when somebody shows up and tells you that they're going to be beaten, humiliated, spit on, arrested, hung on a cross to die, buried, and then raised from the dead and they do it, you kind of want to know what they said before. Or even if you heard it and read it before, you want to go back and read it again because now it means so much more because here he was. Here he was saying, this is what I'm going to do, and then he did it. Mark chapter 15. 
When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, Jesus was on the cross. He had just died. He exclaimed, this man truly was the Son of God. A Roman soldier, somebody who had seen multiple crucifixions, had been a part of this kind of punishment repeatedly, saw what happened, and he claimed this man truly was the Son of God. And you know, though I would agree through and through, I would add one more thing. This man truly was the Son of God. Amen. And he still is. Yes. Amen. Yes. He is risen. Yes. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful to you for loving us so much that you sent your Son for us. Lord, the pain you must have gone through watching what Jesus had to suffer in beatings, in humiliation, in dying the most awful death imaginable. And then, because of having no sin, he was the only one who could carry all sin and cause you, Lord, to turn your back on your son. And you did that for us. Every one of us. And may we take that seriously every single day. And may we take joy and comfort from the love you share through your son. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 So, if you have not grabbed a communion cup and would like to join us in communion, the cups are still in the back and we've got a minute or two for you to go and grab one. The top portion of the cup has a little wafer which represents the body of Christ and then the cup is filled with juice which represents the blood. And so if you are a follower of Christ, and you have invited Jesus into your heart, I would encourage you to take advantage of that and join us in communion. You know, we read a verse, a particular verse, and actually for me it's a set of two verses, and it's pretty much the regular thing. It's what we do over and over and over again. It's also gotten to the point where we've heard it so much that we, we repeat it in our sleep almost without even thinking about it. And it's John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And it says this, For this is how God loved the world. The New Testament version said, new, I'm sorry, the New Living Version. New Living Translation, there we go. The New Living Translation says it this way, and I'm going to share it with you in two, two different versions. But I wanted to share the New Living Translation because it, this verse at the beginning says it this way, for this is how God loved the world. This is how God loved Brian. This is how God loved Joetta. This is how God loved you. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him, so that if Brian believes in him, he will not perish but will have eternal life. You can stick your name in there because this is for you. God sent his son into the world not to judge Brian but to save Brian through him. New International Version. For God so loved Joetta that the world, for God so loved Joetta that he gave his one and only son that who, whoever believes that if Joetta believes in him, she shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to Joetta to condemn, to condemn Joetta, but to save Joetta through him. Your name fits in there. Because that's what it's about. Max Lucado said, the heart, of the, hum the heart of the human problem is the heart of the human. And God's treatment is prescribed in John 3.16. The healing comes from a Savior who has died and was resurrected. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for all that you have done. And as we take, as we take communion this morning, may we be reminded 
of the way that you loved us with such power, with such sacrifice. And Lord, this we take communion every week, but this week, this week it's, it's even more special because this is the week when it's right in front of us. We see Jesus on the cross and we see him outside of the tomb. In Jesus' most precious name, as we take up the bread, we remember and we say amen. Amen. So Jesus asks us to do this in remembrance of him each time we do it. But today I want you to picture it even more fully and see Jesus on the cross. The blood being spilled. And the love being shared because of what he did for us. Let's not take it for granted. Let's give it new meaning and a new priority in our lives to remember that every single day we take breath is a day that the evidence of Christ's love can be flowing through us. Lord, we're so grateful. And right now we speak directly to Jesus. Jesus, you did not have to do what you did. But you did. You did God's will. You said, Lord, I'd rather not do this your will, not mine. And God, you love us so much that you went through with this plan, the rescue plan, to rescue us from darkness, to rescue us from sin, and to rescue us from an eternal, an eternal life that we, we can't imagine how awful it would be to be away from you. In Jesus' name we pray.
touchdown or it's a home run and I, and I watched this just the other day a guy came across the plate stepped on the plate and went like that and I tell you right now the resurrecting king is resurrecting me that means you too pointing to the guy who did it for you yeah. praise right. God all right yeah. Amen. 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 yes touchdown Jesus that's awesome awesome now a couple of quick things that I need to share with you before you run off and that is this I need Three people to come forward real quick. It'll just take a minute. I'm going to ask for Angela Hudson to come up, Diana Nunez to come up, and I need Kayla to come up also. Just come up real quick. Kayla Lipich, shout at you. Come on up. Everybody else can have a seat. All right. So real, real quick, recently, we do something at Christ Church Club of the West called Teacher Appreciation Kits. And what that is, is that is when we put it out there for families uh, and students to nominate teachers to give them an, op for an opportunity to get and receive a nomination for, for doing awesome work, for doing great things. Well, and we have four teachers here this morning that we want to honor, these three and this one. Yeah, nice case. <laughs> this one. And we want to honor them with our own teacher appreciation kit from Christ Church Global West. Diana, here is yours. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, you definitely can start. Angela, here you go. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Kayla. And Christy, and go. Yeah, so, this is from this church body to our teachers, showing them how much we appreciate and love them. And so this was our chance to bring them up front, embarrass them a little bit, and <laughs> give them something nicer. You, make, you guys can go. 
go for it. Thank you. Okay, so the other thing that I didn't want you to run off for is if you have little ones with you this morning, we have a special gift out in the foyer. Uh, if you are uh, fifth grade or younger, and if Andrew was here this morning, he'd be crawling, trying to look like he was younger so he could get something. But being 6'3", it's kind of hard to do. So anyway, Miss Ashley uh, is out in the foyer, and she has, you know, they're not Easter baskets. That's so 2018. We have Easter buckets for our kids, and we want to share them uh, on the way out. The other thing is this. Um, I did bring my camera, as I mentioned before, and if you want to hang around for a few minutes, I'm happy to do a photo uh, of you, if you, especially if you went to the trouble uh, of Easter dresses and Easter outfits. Uh, that would be absolutely awesome, and we can do uh, a picture or two. So thank you so much for being with us here this morning at Christ Church Pueblo West. We love seeing you. We love having you here. And we have something absolutely amazing that is about to come and it's going to start next Sunday, and I want you to focus on the screen for about two minutes and get just a taste of what we're talking about. six-week series next Sunday called Grace Bomb. What Grace Bomb is, is Grace Bomb is our engaging the community in acts of love that are motivated by Jesus. And it's going to change you. It's going to change Pueblo West. And it's a really good opportunity to be a part of changing the world. Look forward to that. A whole lot more details. Great stuff next week be the start. We look forward to having you here and being a part of that. Thanks again for joining us this morning. We look forward to seeing you and hearing from you always. One more quick blessing. Lord, thank you so much for our family this morning who came to share in the joy that is the resurrected Son of God, the resurrected Christ. And it's in his name we say thank you and amen. You are dismissed.